Okay, and uh, I'm going to talk about this recent paper that I wrote with Huang and Edward on uh, some aspects of the black hole string transition. And if time permits, I would also like to mention some related stuff that I'm doing by myself. Okay, so uh, just to set up the stage. So in this talk, we will be considering string theory in that space. So let's consider in R1 comma D minus one. So uh, in Popsky space, time some internal space, which we will leave implicit in this talk. Okay, so I will also use little d, which is capital D minus one to denote the spatial dimensions. And we will be focusing on the structural black hole, the simplest kind of black hole in this space time. So it has long been speculated that if you consider a black hole in string theory and you gradually shrink the size of the black hole, the black hole will eventually turn into a highly excited string, a very long string, when the size of the black hole reaches the uh, string scale, namely the fundamental string size. So, for example, this was pointed out by Horowitz and Kochinsky, and they call this the correspondence principle between black holes and strings. So, why do we even expect such a transition between black hole and string? Um, let me first present an uh, argument that is not actually correct, and we will uh, discuss how to improve the argument later. So the argument involves looking at the relation between the entropy and the mass for both a black hole and the string. So let me remind you that if we look at the relation between the entropy and mass for the black hole, the entropy is proportional to the structural radius times the mass of the black hole. This is simply because that uh, the entropy of a black hole scale as the structural radius to the d minus two power. That is just the uh, area formula for the entropy. And the dimensional analysis tells you that the mass is, has one less power. So if you plot the relation between entropy and mass in, the, in this two dimensional graph, it's an upward bending curve um, because the slope of this curve also grows with the mass. But the behavior for a string is very different. If we uh, just do a very simple calculation of uh, how many states are there at a certain mass or a certain level for a single oscillating string, we find that the entropy of a single oscillating string or a string gas is linear in the mass of the string with a fixed coefficient. So the coefficient here, I'm writing it as the uh, beta h, which I will dis uh, discuss later. But for now, we just need to know that this coefficient is some number that is of order the string length or the length of a fundamental string. Therefore, if you plot the string curve on this graph, you get a, like a linear, linear curve. And strictly speaking, we can only trust the string curve uh, at, at this end, like when the mass is very small, because only then we can neglect the interaction and the gravity effect and really treat it as a free string. Also, for a black hole, we can only trust it when the mass is very large, so that the black hole is very large and the curvature effect and the, the, like the alpha prime corrections in string theory can be neglected. But just a naive extrapolation of these two curves suggests that they meet at some point, at some intermediate point. And what's special about this point is that if we look at the size of the black hole here, just by comparing these two formulas, we find that the size of the black hole is of order the size of a fundamental string. And at this point, the entropy of the black hole also matches with the string. So that's the first hint that uh, made people think that there might be the black hole just turns into a string at this point. Of course, this argument, people soon realize that this argument is not correct because here we are considering a free string and the particular feature about the free string is that once you start to excite it, its size gets larger and larger. And it grows with the excitation in a way that it is proportional to the square root of the entropy. Let's say we are considering a black hole a string with a very large entropy. So the real physical size of such a free string will be much, much larger than the fundamental string size. So this naive argument that says that the size of the black hole and the string are the same uh, is incorrect at, at, this, at this level of the discussion. So later on, I will discuss an improvement of this picture. But before I go there, let me uh, make some comments about this particular number beta h. So why is this parameter important in string theory? So this beta h is the so-called uh, inverse hagedorn temperature. 
okay? And it is proportional to the string length with some order one coefficient. And uh, the specific number depends on which string theory you are looking at. Um, the reason that it is an important parameter is because if you just look at a single oscillating string and count the number of states at high energy, you find that the density of state uh, grows exponentially with the with energy. So it's, this is a very uh, interesting phenomenon that you see in string theory that the, angle, uh, the density of state grows very fast. It's exponential in the energy with this particular coefficient beta hecto. And uh, this behavior tells you that if you now look at the canonical ensemble partition function, Z of beta for a, just a single oscillating string, it is only well defined if the temperature is lower than one over beta hecton, or when the inverse temperature beta is greater than beta hecton. Okay, so that's why people usually say that there is a maximum temperature in string theory, which is the so-called hecton temperature. It just means that the uh, canonical ensemble partition function becomes not well defined. And a useful um, perspective to think about this that will be very useful later is the space time perspective. So just as how we usually start study uh, finite temperature physics in quantum field theory, we consider the theory not in a Lorentzian space time, but in a Euclidean space time for which the time is now a circle with length that is given by the inverse temperature. Okay, so here I'm drawing it schematically as a cylinder, and this circle is the Euclidean time, and the other is the spatial directions, which is Rd. Um, but an interesting phenomenon in string theory is that whenever you have a circle, the string will wind on the circle. So you can have a string that just wraps the circle. It can wrap multiple times, once, twice. It can also wrap in, in either directions. So that leads to uh, many winding modes in the spectrum of the string theory on this medical. So the particular string mode that will be very important later is the winding mode, which winds only once around the Euclidean circle. The reason that it is important is because if we look at the mass of this winding mode, it has the form that is beta square minus uh, beta hexagon square, okay? So the special feature of this is it becomes massless when you approach the hexagon temperature. But all the other winding modes will ha still have a finite mass, a mass of, that is of order string scale, uh, even when you're close to the hexagon temperature. Street, strictly speaking, this formula uh, that I'm writing here, beta square minus beta hexagon square is only uh, correct in the bosonic and type two string theory. In the Hedroni string theory, uh, which has a left right asymmetry, asymmetry, the winding mode also necessarily carries some momentum along the time direction. So the exact formula is a little bit more complicated, but the feature that it becomes massless uh, when we are close to the hexagonal temperature is still true in the heterodic string theory. So later on, let me just use this formula to simplify uh, the discussion. Okay. So the idea is that uh, from the space-time pr perspective, uh, we can describe this winding mode using an effective theory that is a complex scalar view in little d direct dimensions. The reason that it is a complex scalar view is that is because we are already dealing with two winding modes here, uh, a winding mode that has winding number one uh, and the other with winding number minus one, okay? So they can be grouped together into a complex scalar view. And if you write down the effective field theory, it has a kinetic term, uh, it also has a like a mass term. And the special thing here is the mass becomes zero when you are approaching the hexagon temperature. Okay, so um, after these comments, let me uh, come back to the uh, early problem that we saw that the naive uh, argument for the correspondence principle doesn't work because at the, at the point where you, you might expect the black hole to turn into a string, it seems that the physical size of a string is much larger than the black hole with the corresponding mass. But in that analysis, we're already looking at the free string, namely we neglected the gravitational attraction between different parts of the string or more generally between different parts of a string gas. So you might think that uh, once we include gravity attraction, the, the gravity pulls different parts of the string together and the actual physical size might shrink. And it might be that it actually shrinks the object into the fundamental string size. 
Okay, so that's uh, the an analysis that we want to do. And this was actually uh, discussed nicely in a beautiful paper by uh, Horowitz and Pochinski in 97, where they showed a way to attack this problem. They used an effective theory to describe uh, what the effect of gravity attraction would be for this highly excited string gas. So um, their idea was to consider an effective theory that when we are very close to the hagedorn temperature, but still uh, below the hagedorn temperature, namely in terms of the parameter that I was talking about uh, is when the difference between beta and beta hagedorn is much smaller than the string length. Okay, so we, we are looking at the theory in this limit. And uh, what's nice about this limit is that we can, in this limit, there are just a few light fields in, in, this, in the effective theory. And when we look at effective theory, we can just focus on these light fields, which uh, governs the long distance physics. And as usual in string theory, there are some massless fields, which include gravity, uh, the Dilaton field, as well as the B field. And the B field will not actually be excited uh, in this solution. So I will leave it implicit uh, later. And as I discussed, there is also a nearly massless field, which is this uh, winding, winding mode, the field corresponding to this winding mode, which I denote by chi. So you can just write down an effective action like this, which includes the Einstein Huber term, the kinetic term for the uh, Dilaton, and the, the action for the chi field. But there is another mode that I haven't really talked about, which is this phi field. Okay? So where does this phi field come from? So this phi field, we can call it the so-called the radian. The, the reason that you will have this is because the space-time is dynamical. So even though you fix the length of the Euclidean time at infinity to be some fixed number beta, inside the space-time, the, the length of the circle can fluctuate due to back reactions, et cetera. So that gives us a, another mode that is um, if we parameterize the local length of the circle to be beta times some e to the phi, and under the KK reduction, that gives us a massless field in little d dimensions in the spatial, di in the spatial directions, which is uh, written as the phi field here, okay? So um, let me also mention that this phi field, uh, apart from its own kinetic term, it also shows up in the mass term of the chi field. The reason is that the mass of the chi field depends on the local length of the Euclidean circle rather than the length at infinity. That's just a, um, uh, that, that, that's just a based on locality of the effective theory, but you can also work out what this mass in principle should be by computing some uh, correlation function of vertex operators in this theory. So there are different ways to derive this effective action. But the final conclusion is that this class will also include this, by, uh, this field. So what Horowitz and Pochinski did is to look for a localized condensate solution of this chi field uh, within this effective theory. And at first sight, it looks uh, a little bit complicated to find a solution of this complicated action, but there is a very nice approximation that they pointed out. That is, if we already look at how the chi field is coupled to all the other degrees of freedom, we see that, for example, uh, the coupling between the chi and the little d dimensional metric and the little d dimensional dilaton are all proportional to the mass square. And as, as I already said, that we are in a limit where the mass square is very, very small. So here I'm expanding the mass square um, in this variable phi and the, to the zeroth order at infinity, as I said, when beta min minus beta hagadon is very small, the mass square is very small. And um, that tells you that the coupling between the chi field and, uh, and like, for example, the d-dimensional metric, d-dimensional dilaton is very small. But um, what they find out is that there is one particular coupling that is not small. So that coupling is the coupling between this chi field and this phi field, okay? The reason is that if you expand the mass well uh, to the lin linear order in the phi field, this coefficient, which I denote by kappa here is some order one number, it's not a small number. 
So this is the, the only coupling in this effective theory that is not small, namely the coupling between the chi field and the phi field. So the idea is to organize everything in a protubative series in this small number beta minus beta hecto divided by the string length. And to the leading order of that expansion, uh, the equations become somewhat simpler. So basically you, you just need to solve two equations. The first equation is the equation of motion for the chi field, which is just the free equation plus uh, a potential corresponding to the phi field, okay? And the second equation here is uh, Einstein equation. It, it de describes how a non-zero wave of the chi field back reacts the size of the Euclidean circle. So in the end, the, the problem boils down to a coupled nonlinear differential equation. And uh, one can try to solve these equations numerically. And in fact, uh, in the case where the space time dimension is four, these equations are exactly the same as the equations some people who study both Einstein condensate have solved before. So you can just take their solution and apply it here and it, uh, you get the, the explicit solution, okay? And uh, the final conclusion is that just by looking at these equations, spherical symmetric and normalizable solutions can be found in uh, only when the capital D or the space time dimension is four, five, and six. So the physical reason that the solution does not exist above six dimension is because uh, when you go to higher dimensions, the gravity uh, becomes weaker at long distances because it's a, uh, like the gravity decays faster. And as I already mentioned that the free string is already very large. So you need a, need a somewhat strong gravity interaction at uh, long distances to bring the string together to form a condensate solution. To, to be a localized solution. So that explains why uh, the solution does not exist when the dimension is too large. So later on, let me just uh, focus on the case where the uh, capital D is equal to four, that is four space time dimensions. And here I'm showing you like the explicit form of the solution. So here, chi hat and phi hat, there are just some uh, rescaled version of the chi and phi here. So basically chi and phi are some positive power of this small number multiplying uh, chi hat and phi hat, okay? So in terms of this rescaled uh, quantities, chi hat is, uh, it decays exponentially when you are increasing the radial direction. So this row is a rescaled version of the radial direction. So it decays uh, exponentially, that tells you that it's indeed a localized object, localized solution. While if you look at the phi field, namely it's basically the proportional to the Newtonian potential generated by this localized object, uh, it, of course it decays as one over rho distances. But it's interesting to look at its behavior at short distances, namely at the center of the solution, because uh, here, I want to highlight that, first of all, the, the value of the, this phi field is negative in the center. That means that as you go uh, from the infinity towards the center, the size of the Euclidean circle shrinks. So like the local temperature in the center, it becomes higher uh, compared to the temperature in infinity. But still, this phi field is, is finite, and actually this this rescaled version is finite. That means that the, uh, the actual phi field is still very, very small when you are close to the center. That means that even though the, the circle shrinks a little bit, it is still finite and does not vanish. So this should be contrasted with the behavior of a Euclidean black hole for which if you go from infinity towards the horizon, the Euclidean circle eventually uh, shrinks to a point. So that means that this solution in terms of geometry is a uh, very, very different from a Euclidean black hole. It's more like a, a geometry that you get for a star in, a, in, Lorentz's, in Lorentzian signature, okay? So, um, so basically I discussed some details of this, this solution. So what is this solution good for, okay? So as I will argue, this is really a star solution of strings. So it described in, in the Lorentzian signature, it really describes 
a star made of like uh, a highly excited string gas and is bound together by gravity. And I will refer to it as the horowitz porchinsky solution. So even though, well, I say it's a star solution, but that is of course uh, not very accurate because it's really a solution that we find in the Euclidean signature. Uh, because only in the Euclidean signature, this winding mode is a well-defined notion. Without going to Euclidean signature, it's not clear what the winding mode means in the Lorentzian signature. But uh, as, as I will discuss right now, we will see that many of these, the properties of this Euclidean solution have very nice interpretation in the Lorentzian signature. So that tells us that it really describes the physics of a star in the Lorentzian signature. Perhaps the, let me uh, go back to the, uh, the problem that we faced before that we say that the physical size of a free string is much larger than the black hole. So that problem is nicely uh, solved by this solution found by Horowitz and Koczynski. So basically we want to look at the size of the solution. To look at the size of the solution, we can simply analytically continue the metric as well as the stress tensor into the Lorentzian signature. And that gives us the size of the string star in the Lorentzian signature. And here I'm showing you the answer in, uh, when d is equal to four. So the vertical axis is the size of the object and the horizontal, the horizontal axis is the mass of the object. So I've already discussed what this green, uh, this green curve and the blue curve. So the green curve is a free string and the size grows as a square root uh, of the mass or the entropy so uh, that is shown here. Uh, this linear curve is for the black hole that the size of the black hole grows linearly with, uh, with the mass in four dimensions. But now we have a, a new solution, which is the horowitz porchinsky solution. And you see that its size decreases with the mass. And so it interpolates between the, the free string curve and the black hole curve, okay? Um, so in this picture, let me also mention that there are these two blobs, one orange and one purple. So they correspond to re uh, regimes where we don't have analytic control at the moment. So basically we can only trust uh, the horowitz porchinsky solution when, we, when the size is much greater than uh, the one, the string length, because only when the size is very large, we can trust the effective field theory description. We only trust the horowitz porchinsky solution up here, but a naive extrapolation of that result would suggest that it meets, uh, the size meets with the black hole at the correct place where we might expect that, might have expected that the black hole to turn into a highly excited stream. So this fixed uh, the problem that we saw earlier about the correspondence principles. Um, of course, with this, specific solution, we can discuss much more than just the size of the solution. One very interesting thing to think about is the thermodynamics of the solution, and in particular, the entropy of the solution. So as we know that for a Euclidean solution, one can adopt the so-called Gibbons Hawking procedure to compute its thermodynamic quantities. So usually this kind of procedure is applied to black holes, but here we can also apply it to the horowitz porchinsky solution and following the same derivation, one ends up with a, a formula for the entropy that is essentially, so these are just some order one number that is not important, but is beta hagedorn times uh, one over g Newton. So it's a very large entropy because it's, uh, it's an entropy that is multiplied by one over g Newton. So it's a classical entropy and also multiplying the integral of the uh, chi square in space. Okay. And so in the paper, we discussed that if you now compare the entropy uh, with the mass of the object, so you can also extract the mass by using the Gibbons Hawking procedure or by looking at how the metric falls off at infinity, you see that the entropy at leading order is just given by beta hagedorn times the mass uh, plus some small corrections that are of higher orders uh, in the small parameters that are we're expanding in, namely the beta minus beta, beta hagedorn. Okay. So the reason that you might, first of all, the reason you might expect some corrections compared to the free string answer, which is the leading term, is because 
um, for one thing, the local temperature is higher in the center of the star. So that means that physically, locally, it you, you can excite more states. Another effect is that uh, now the, the object is confined in a smaller volume. So intuitively, the strings has less space to oscillate into. So that might bring the entropy down. So in, the, in our paper, we discussed some of these corrections and we worked out uh, these corrections, for example, in, in four dimensions. But conceptually, now let me focus on the first term, the leading term, which is beta hexagon times the mass. So it matches the entropy of a highly excited string gas. Okay. And why is this something that uh, I want to mention? Okay. So this kind of Euclidean methods, the Gibbons Hawking type method, have been very successful in computing various entropies in quantum gravity. For example, in, in, in in recent years, people have applied this kind of method and its generalization to situations of an evaporating black hole and successfully reproduced the unitary page curve for evaporating black hole, at least in some toy models. But what is nice about this uh, horowitz Poshinsky solution is that it's an example that we can compute the entropy on one hand uh, through the Euclidean method while on the other hand, we know what we are really computing in the Lorenzi signature. We know what the microstates are in the Lorenzi signature. It's just the uh, states of highly excited uh, string gas. But as a contrast, we don't really have the, this perspective for a black hole at the moment. We don't really know what the microstates of a black hole are in the Lorenzi signature or how to describe them. So that perhaps is a motivation uh, for us to understand this Horowitz opportunity solution better. And in the later part of the talk, I will discuss the uh, uh, attempt further in this direction. Okay, so uh, for now, let me discuss one more property of this uh, Horowitz opportunity solution. So as I, as I have shown here, there are two blobs in this picture where we don't have uh, full control of the solution. So, it's easier to understand, what's easier to understand is this orange block. So it's basically where the free string curve uh, meets the horowitz poczynski solution, okay? So physically it's clear what's happening. It's just that the free string, you, as you increase its mass in the horizontal axis, the free string becomes larger and larger. And at the same time, the gravity attraction also becomes stronger and it starts to pull the free string together. So the uh, fit, physics int intuition is there. Um, so we can use the physics intuition to estimate when such transition between the, uh, the free string and the horowitz poczynski solution should happen. So from the free string side, you can just do a back of envelope estimation by considering a Schrodinger equation for a small excitation that has the mass that is of order string scale in a gravitational potential generated by this mass and ask when the bound state of the Schrodinger equation uh, start to form, okay? And just by doing this very simple calculation, you find that it starts to form at the mass that is of order one over G string to some positive power. So the specific power like uh, uh, four over three here depends on the particular dimension that we're in, but it's always one over G string to some uh, positive power. You can also understand the same transition from the horowitz poczynski side, namely we start here and go towards a smaller mass and larger size of the object. And the reason that there is the transition is because the horowitz poczynski solution is a classical solution. It's a classical solution which satisfies uh, the equation of oceans. But you are only supposed to trust the classical solution when the quantum fluctuations around the classical solutions are small. So you can just do a scaling argument and ask when the quantum fluctuations become large. And that gives you the same answer that uh, when the mass is ordered this quantity or when the size becomes very, very large, uh, the object becomes very dilute and the quantum fluctuations start to become large. And they start to uh, turn into just a free string and the gravity attraction will not be important. So physically, we don't really expect any kind of phase transition uh, in this orange block, physically, because it's just uh, the gravity starts to become stronger and start to gradually pull the string together. 
Okay. But the next part of the talk will be mainly about this uh, purple blob uh, because. So if you naive extrapolate the Horowitz opportunity solution and the black hole curve, it suggests that it meets, these two curves must meet at some point in this, in this block. Uh, so the question is now, are these two curves just smoothly turning to each other? Like if you continue this red curve, does it just turn into the black hole curve? Or is, is there a phase transition in between, of the, in between the two curves? Uh, if there is a phase transition, of which order should the phase transition be? Okay, so that's the kind of question that I will uh, I, I'd like to discuss later. Um, okay, so before I really discuss this transition, let me just uh, make a few more comparison between the Horowitz opportunity solution and the black hole uh, to better motivate like uh, the transition between the two. So. Both of them are classical solutions in string theory. Namely, they satisfy the classical equations motions. And therefore, they are both described by certain Walsh CFTs. So this is a basic statement of string theory. Namely, the classical solutions are described by some uh, CFTs. But we only know the explicit construction of these CFTs in very different regimes. We know it for the black hole when the uh, inverse temperature is much larger than the string length, namely the black hole is very large and the curvature is small. Um, in that regime, we know, we know the, what the CFT is. It's a nonlinear signal model on the black hole background. While on the, for the HP solution, uh, we only know how to construct the solution in this opposite regime when the beta uh, difference between beta and beta hecton is very, very small. So we only know their construction in different regime, but we are asking how they are connected in the middle, okay? And both of these solutions, they break the same symmetry. They break the winding symmetry. So the fact that the Horowitz opportunity solution breaks the winding symmetry is obvious that the winding mode has a VAF in that solution. The, the, the fact that the black hole also breaks the winding symmetry is also not difficult to see. Uh, you can basically say that if you uh, wrap a string on a Euclidean black hole, let's say a string with some winding, because the, in the Euclidean black hole, the Euclidean circle shrinks to a point at the horizon, this winding string can simply move to the horizon and become unwrapped. So the winding number is not a, a conserved quantum number on this background. That tells you that the black hole also breaks the winding symmetry at the classical level. So basically this is saying that the usual Landau paradigm does not apply uh, in this discussion of the transition. So that might be the first reason that you might think there can be a smooth interpolation between the two solutions. Okay. And another similarity between the two is that both have an entropy at the classical level. Namely, they both have an entropy that is of order one over G Newton. It's a very large entropy. Um, but a big difference that will be important in the following is that the black hole has a horizon um, namely the Euclidean circle shrinks to a point while the Horowitz opportunity solution does not. So let me now come to the question that are the two CFTs uh, smoothly connected? Um, by the way, if there are any questions, just uh, interrupt me. So uh, in short, uh, the conclusion that we found is that we found different behavior in different string theories. And I don't think we have a very conceptual understanding of why uh, they appear to be different. But in, in the type two string theory, there is a clear argument that says that these two solutions cannot be smoothly connected as Walsh CFTs. In the heterogeneous string theory, however, they seem to be likely smoothly connected. We cannot find any obstruction of a smooth interpolation and uh, their argument towards such a smooth, connect, smooth connection, even though we don't ultimately have a proof, uh, we did not really consider the bosonic string case, mainly because it already has a tachyon in the spectrum. And there's nothing that uh, prohibits that uh, from, under, from condensing in, on this background. So we didn't really consider the bosonic string. So, how do we really approach this problem of how the, uh, whether the two CFTs are smoothly connected? So the main idea here is that 
we don't really have a clear construction of the two CFTs in the middle. But a way around that is to use some invariants for supersymmetric sigma models that cannot vary smoothly with parameters. So you can just compute these invariants perturbatively in different regimes and see whether they are the same because they cannot vary smoothly, uh, very smoothly as you tune the parameter. And the parameter here is of course just the uh, parameter beta or the inverse temperature. So perhaps the most famous uh, type of this uh, supersymmetric invariance is the so-called Wheaton index, which is discussed by Edward in the beautiful paper in 82. And it, it is defined as a trace of um, e to the minus beta h multiplying by minus one to the f, while f is the Walsh fermion number. Also, let me emphasize that this beta here has nothing to do with uh, the other betas that have showed up in the talk. This beta is the Walsh temperature rather than the space time temperature. So this beta can be just an arbitrary positive number. It's just uh, introduced to make the sum uh, well defined. So as was shown in this paper, if you consider uh, sigma models with one comma one Walsh supersymmetry, that will be the case for the type two string theory. The Wheaton index of a nonlinear sigma model is equal to the Euler characteristic of the target space time that the string is propagating on. Okay, that instructs us to just look at the topology or the Euler characteristic of the Horowitz Pochinsky solution and the Blahau solution. But of course, there is something subtle here is that the Horowitz Pochinsky solution and the Blahau solution, they are non compact, they go to infinity as you increase the radial direction. But the physical argument is that as you go towards infinity, both geometries are exactly the same. They have the exact same form as an S1, that is the Euclidean circle, multiplying by the transverse sphere, uh, S d minus one, okay? So near infinity, they look exactly the same. And you can imagine that well, you can break a little bit the conformal symmetry and uh, then you can compatify them in the same way that infinity then makes the Euler characteristic well-defined. But the upshot here is that what's really important is really the geometry near the center of the solution. And as I have emphasized multiple times, they are very different. So let me explain better what this picture means. If you look at the Horowitz Pochinsky solution, uh, as I said, the Euclidean circle doesn't shrink to a point. So it's still a circle uh, at the origin. But the transverse sphere just shrink to a point at the origin of the space time. Okay, so it looks like this. But for the black hole, on the other hand, the um, the circle shrinks to a point, while the transverse sphere the transverse sphere still has a finite size at the horizon. Then the size is just a shorter radius. So that tells you that once you compactify them in the same way, the infinity, the order characteristic of them is actually different. And so therefore the Wheaton index is different. You find that the Wheaton index of the black hole minus the Wheaton index of the Horowitz Pochinsky solution is given by two rather than zero. Strictly speaking, this computation only works in uh, even dimensions, for example, four and six dimensions. For all dimensions, you need to change the index a little bit, but it will suggest a similar conclusion. So let me not go into that. Um, but the point that the index is different uh, means that there must be a singular point in the way that, so that the Wheaton index can jump. And later on, I will discuss more about what could happen uh, in the middle. But for now, let me also mention uh, that you can interpret this number two as two extra normalizable harmonic forms that the black hole has. So let me remind you that when you count the Wheaton index, you are basically counting uh, different harmonic forms on the geometry. And the black hole has two extra harmonic forms. One is the uh, volume form of the transverse sphere. The other is the Hodge, Hodge dew of that form. Okay. So that is just saying that uh, this difference too really comes from the near horizon region because all those harmonic forms uh, live near the horizon. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you consider a sigma model with zero comma one Walsh supersymmetry, that is the case for the heterotic string theory because it only has right moving supersymmetry. 
the index is not equal to the Euler, Euler characteristic, it's equal to the index of the drop operator in the target space. It vanishes both for both manifolds because both the Horowitz opportunity solution and the whole, they are symmetric under parity transformation, while the Dirac operator is, of course, odd under parity. More generally, in the literature, uh, for all the known invariants uh, for, for a zero comma one watch supersymmetric supersymmetry uh, sigma model, uh, they do not distinguish the two solutions. So there's no obvious obstruction in the heterotic case compared to the type two case. But with this um, indexes, indices, it's just a very indirect way of telling us uh, there cannot be a smooth connection uh, in the type two case. Ultimately, we will be interested in if there is no uh, smooth, smooth connection, what already happens in the middle. If there is a phase transition of which order the phase transition is, um, but at the current stage, it seems very difficult to answer this problem because many because we don't really have a concrete construction offshore problem. So let me uh, uh, now tell you what what off offshore problem means. So in the end, we are interested in how these CFTs, they are connected to each other. But as I said, we don't really have explicit construction of the CFTs, but we can take one step back and think of these CFTs as some IR limit, infrared limit of some UV linear signal model, which we can construct explicitly, okay? And you can construct the linear signal models in such a way that so here I'm drawing schematically uh, the potential of the linear SIG model. You can construct it in a way that in some parameter regime, the ground state manifold of the linear SIG model uh, has the topology, right topology of Horowitz Polchinski solution. So after you integrate out all the massive modes in the linear SIG model, what's describing this ground state manifold will be a nonlinear SIG model uh, on, uh, of, with that topology. And under the RG, we expect that nonlinear sigma model to flow to the actual CFT, which is the Horowitz opportunity solution. And in the UV, you can design the potential of the linear sigma model in such a way that if you change the parameter regime, the ground state manifold changes topology. It changes from the Horowitz opportunity type solution to a black hole type topology. And in, on that side, if you consider the nonlinear SIG model describing this ground state manifold and under the RG, it will flow to the black hole CFT. So the point here is that since we have an explicit construction of the linear SIG model in the UV, you can first understand better what the transition look like in the UV. And then maybe if you can understand the RG better then you have a better understanding what's the, the nature of the transition uh, at the level of the CFT. So in the paper, we mostly just did the first step, namely we, we considered such a linear SIG model and this, this discussed what the transition is, um, look like in the linear SIG model. So let me make one comment that here I'm saying that if you have a ground state manifold that has the right topology, it flows to the CFT, uh, that is not entirely a wishful thinking because one reason is that, of course, under the RG flow, you usually expect to land on CFTs. Another reason is that the black hole, for example, the Schwarzschild solution is the unique solution of Einstein equation plus small corrections with the right topologies and symmetries, etc. So if you start with a geometry that has the topology of the black hole, and under the RG flow of the nonlinear sigma model, namely the Ricci flow equation, you expect to really land on the real black hole geometry. And in fact, this was demonstrated explicitly by Hedrick and Weissman in uh, some papers in 2006 and 2007, where they start with some geometry which is not exactly the structural solution, um, but then apply the Ricci flow and they, they show that you, you really land, land, land on the, the actual structural solution. 
uh, under the RG, okay? But there is also a fine print here that both the Horowitz opportunity solution and the black hole solutions, they have a negative mode. So this is perhaps well known for Euclidean black hole that a Euclidean black hole in flat space has a negative mode. Basically, if you change its size a little bit, it will become infinitely large or it will just evaporate to infinitely small. This is also related to the fact that uh, Euclidean black hole in flat space has a negative specific heat. Okay. So there is actually a similar negative mode for the Horowitz opportunity solution. Namely, they are not really stable object in the canonical example, but they are stable object in the micro canonical example. In terms of the discussion here, it simply means that we would need to fine tune some parameters in the UV to really uh, end up in the correct CFT. Otherwise, the RG flow will be unstable. It will just lead you to, for example, an infinitely large black hole or infinitely small black hole. This fact was also uh, demonstrated in this paper by Hedrick and Weissman. Okay, long story short, uh, in the paper we uh, considered some explicit construction of, of sigma, linear sigma models that will achieve the, achieve the job, okay? Let me here uh, describe a simpler case, which is the case for 1 comma 1 supersymmetry. And uh, it's the type two string theory. So in that case, you can consider the following super potential. Uh, the detail already doesn't matter too much here. Uh, what was important is that there is a field P, which I will explain later, but there is also uh, two X fields, which parameterize the circle direction, the S1 direction. And there are little d number of Y fields, which parameterize the field direction, okay? So you just use these fields, there are scalar superfuels, and after you write down such kind of super potential, uh, the analysis at tree level is very simple. Namely, the supersymmetric ground state that satisfies some simple algebraic equations. So for example, uh, here I, I'm writing down the equations, the details doesn't really matter that much. What's important is that in one parameter regime, that is when C minus AB is greater than zero, so C, A, B are just some tunable parameters in the, in the model. The geometry determined by these equations look like a black hole. Namely, if you look at the geometry, the size of the circle shrinks to a point while the transverse sphere is, still has a finite size at the horizon, at the so-called horizon. On the other hand, uh, in this solution, the graph of the P field is, is zero. Now, what's interesting about this linear sigma model is that if you now tune the parameter to the other side, when C minus AB becomes uh, negative, the geometry of the supersymmetric ground state changes, uh, changes. It changes to that of a Horowitz opportunity solution. Namely, the uh, circle doesn't shrink anymore while the transverse sphere shrinks. Again, in this solution, uh, the VEF of the P is still zero. Now, as I said, the written index jumps in, in, in the type two case. So something must be happening in the middle. And since here we have a explicit construction of the model of the linear sigma model, we should be able to tell what happens in the middle. So what happens here at the classical level is that when C minus AB is exactly zero, there's a new branch of solution that opens up. So there is new family of solution to these equations, namely, you can have a solution where X and Y are both zero, while the P, uh, P field can have a non-zero value and can be arbitrary value, okay? So geometrically, it's like an infinite line, an infinite one-dimensional line. But of course, here, uh, since here we only have one comma one supersymmetry, in general, we need to be worried uh, about loop corrections. We should not just look at these simple tree-level equations. And after doing some analysis at the loop levels, you'll see that it changes the answer a little bit. So the black hole side is not changed. So when C minus AB is greater than zero, you still have just one connected ground state manifold that looks like a black hole. And under the RG, one is back there to flow to the black hole CFT. But what happens is that once C minus AB is now negative, Apart from the horowitz potensky solution, that is this connected part here, there are some isolated massive vacuum of this linear sigma model. 
which are uh, uh, drawn as these blue points here. Okay, so there are some isolated vacuum, and they under the ultra flow they don't flow to CFTs because there are no massless excitations around them. And these va massive vacuum are parameterized by zero value of x and y, but non-zero by fixed value of p. And these two vacuum, for example, they compensate for the difference in the index found in the CFT. So it's like initially on the black hole side, you have a continuous manifold, but as you tune the parameter in the linear signal model, some parts of the uh, geometry branches off, separates from the continuum and becomes this massive vacuum on the other side. Um, so let me make some comments about this construction. So this specific construction does not really behave too well under the RG and uh, let me not go into that, but basically the, the short, short uh, answer is that we propose the improvement of the model. Basically what happens is that uh, since loop corrections is important in this model, under the RG, uh, in this naive model, the size of the circle grows slowly towards infinity, which is not a good behavior because we know that in the CFT you should approach a, a constant and infinity but you can improve the model slightly to get rid of this behavior. So that's uh, already in the version two of the paper. Um, a conceptual question that we don't have a full answer is that the massive vacua, uh, they arise from this linear sigma model construction. A priori, they don't have uh, any role in the string theory discussion because string theory focuses on the CFTs. Okay? They focus on the CFT in the IR and they don't have the linear sig model to begin with. So the question is, do this massive vacuum have some interpretation in the CFT or in the string theory? We have some naive speculation, but uh, we don't really have uh, uh, very concrete things to say at the moment. In the heterotic case, on the other hand, one can apply a very similar construction of uh, considering a linear sig model. In that case, there is no analog of massive vacuum whatsoever. And it seems that the linear sigma model just suggests a smooth transition in the UV. Of course, we didn't already uh, discuss the RG flow explicitly. So there might still be some singular behavior under the RG, uh, or there can be some other effects that we haven't considered. But it seems at the level of linear sigma model, it suggests a smooth transition, smooth connection between the two two side, the black hole side and the horowitz potency side. The last comment is that uh, one cannot exclude the possibility that the transition is actually smooth, even in the type two case, but involves string loop effect or the quantum effects that are not considered in, the, in our analysis. Uh, because we are just looking at the Washi CFTs, which is exactly at the classical limit where we did not consider any uh, string loop effects. Um, of course, the phase transition is also possible and perhaps natural from this discussion. But a higher level argument is, of course, that imagine that in the end, if we are powerful enough and we can consider all the string loop effects, including the non perturbative ones, eventually the, it should be a smooth connection. Because after all, there cannot be phase transitions in a system with finite degrees of freedom. And we know, well, at least we believe that the black hole is a system with finite degrees of freedom. And of course, a stream gas is also a system with finite degrees of freedom. So in the end, we expect a smooth transition uh, after you include all the quantum effects. So uh, in the maybe uh, last 10 minutes or so, let me uh, mention an application that I'm thinking about. And actually, I think, uh, I will have a paper which will appear soon about this. It's uh, more about what what we can, what more can we use this horowitz potency solution to um, to teach us some lesson about Euclidean black holes. So let me recap a little bit. So the horowitz potency solution is similar in many ways to the Euclidean black hole. It's some classical solution uh, in the Euclidean signature it can be used to compute the entropy of the Lorentzian theory, but both the horowitz potency solution and the black hole have some drawbacks. Namely, they don't really provide us with a discrete spectrum 
or they don't provide us with what microstates are. They don't even tell us that there is a discrete spectrum, okay? So for the black hole, in recent years, people have been using a particular quantity called the spectral form factor to diagnose the discreteness of the spectrum. So people usually define it as the square as of a analytic, analytically continued partition function. Namely, usually we just have a Z of beta, but you take beta to beta plus IT and uh, you take the square of this quantity. This is the so-called spectral form factor. And for the reason, uh, for some reason that I won't have time to discuss, uh, rather than considering this canonical ensemble quantity, it's much better to consider a microcanonical ensemble quantity, which is defined as uh, I, I, as here. So uh, you sum over all the energy eigenstates uh, with this phase e to the minus i e t uh, within some energy window that is given by this Gaussian Gaussian window. Okay, so. Um, you define this, this quantity and the square of this will be the so-called spectral form factor. And the thing is, you can compute this quantity using the semi-classical gravity or use, using the Euclidean black hole. Of course, the Euclidean black hole does not have a discrete, uh, the Euclidean black hole does not make the discreteness of the spectrum manifest. So, you need to compute it in some different ways using a different formula. But the upshot is that if you already compute this quantity for Euclidean black hole, you get an exponentially decaying curve. It decays very, very fast with respect to time. So if you look at log of this uh, spectral form factor, it becomes negative at order one time, okay? So that's the answer you will get from a semi-classical computation from Euclidean black hole. Now, this answer looks really weird if we remember that if the entropy of the black hole is really uh, a finite number, the area over 4G, the spectrum for a black hole in the end is, a, is discrete. And if you, you have a discrete spectrum, this quantity can never become, well, it will be very weird for this quantity to become exponentially small because this quantity in the end is a sum over order one, order one terms. Like all this, each term in the sum is of order one, and you are summing over an exponentially many order one terms. So at most, you will expect this answer to decay to order one rather than exponentially small. So of course, this is not a problem that I just pointed out. It's a well-recognized problem. And uh, in some simple cases, people have proposed that um, if you include some wormholes in the gravity path integral, the wormholes can give you an uh, order one and rising answer like this, like this black, uh, black like this blue curve here. Okay, so this is what this was most famously shown by Sat Shankar and Stanford in some beautiful papers in 2018 and 2019, where they looked at this this kind of quantities in some toy models. But the thing is, it's hard to integrate. Uh, wormholes in the context, for example, of holography uh, in a theory with fixed Hamiltonian. So this has been a, a, a topic that has been discussed being by many people. So let me not mention it here. So the expectation that the expectation is that if you really look at this quantity in, for example, angles for super young mu's, you should expect like uh, some fluctuation, order one fluctuations, rather than really being an exponentially small quantity. But the question that I want to uh, use the last few minutes to talk about is that um, we have a similar problem for the horowitz kochinsky solution. Since it's also a classical solution, just like the Euclidean black hole, if you compute this spectral form factor, you get a similar decay, like decay to exponentially small, which is weird because we know that a string gas has a discrete spectrum. So how, how come you get an exponentially small quantity? And this is a question that I first heard about uh, from Stephen Schenker in a talk, and in a talk by Juan, he, he asked this question. Basically, the question is that in the, in the context of the horowitz kochinsky solution, can we understand what needs to be added to the solution such that uh, the answer will respect the discreteness of the spectrum? 
So to really resolve this problem, we can first return to the free string limit, namely we ignore the gravity attraction and first understand what the behavior of the spectral form factor is for a free string. And then we can start to include gravity. So the reason that free string is simple is because we know the exact spectrum for a free string. And in fact, we can simply compute this quantity numerically. And if you do a simple numerical experiment, you see that initially it's correct. The answer given by the horowitz portuguese solution is correct. It decays exponentially. The log of this quantity decays exponentially, but at some point it starts to rise again, okay? It starts to rise, it's essentially flat, but it has a slowly up, upwarding trend. And if you zoom into this, this, this graph, you see there are these bumps, there are these many peaks, okay? So there seems to be a much more feature than, than we have uh, discussed, like using the Horowitz Pochinsky solution. Let me also mention that uh, as I discussed in this talk, the, lead, uh, the early part of this graph is governed by the winding modes that has winding number one and minus one, and they don't have momentum uh, in the time direction. So this n denotes the momentum in the time direction, okay? So as I will be discussing uh, in the paper, so in fact, the structure of the spectral form factor in the string theory for string gas is can be fully characterized by winding modes, but not only, not just by using these winding modes, the winding mode people usually talk about. To really describe the later part, you need to introduce the other winding modes. So in general, if you consider this, this thermal manifold, you can ask when does the winding mode becomes uh, massless? And the usual winding mode, of course, they become they become massless at a hexagonal temperature. But in general, a winding mode becomes massless at a complex value of beta. So here I'm just writing down this, uh, the super simple uh, on shell condition and level matching condition for the string modes on the thermal manifold. And in general, the solution to these solutions, uh, to these equations, uh, with, for example, n being non zero, namely they have some momentum in the time direction will be at complex value of beta. These singularities or these uh, new massless modes, they are not important in usual thermodynamic discussion, but they are really important in the spectral form factor as you go towards late time. So essentially the conclusion is that a winding mode that becomes massless at some complex beta will lead to a peak in this graph at time that is of uh, exactly at the imaginary part of this beta where it becomes massless. So that is the conclusion that I will be, uh, that, uh, that will be shown in, in my paper. So uh, this will uh, perhaps be the next to last slide. Uh, so once we have a uh, gravity attraction based on the argument by Horowitz and Pochinsky, it seems very natural to expect that all the winding modes they show up in this curve also have their own horowitz potency solution, which you can potentially construct by going to uh, the inverse temperature where they become nearly massless. So this suggests that the resolution to the puzzle in, in for a string gas or in the case of horowitz potency solution is not to add something to the horowitz potency solution, but to add a family of other classical solutions corresponding to other winding modes that these classical solutions look like horowitz potency solution, but they are for other winding modes. Um, similar question can be asked in uh, weakly coupled large gauge theories. So in that context, people usually use the thermal holonomy to diagnose the phase transition of a uh, a large n gauge theory, for example, looking at the valve of the Polyakov loop. And you can ask a, the same question about, for example, the spectral form factor in the large n free gauge theory or weakly coupled gauge theory. And you can repeat a similar exercise and there one also identify new set of points that leads to a growth uh, of the uh, spectral form factor. So that will also be discussed uh, in this paper uh, to appear. But of course, in the end, the final mystery is, of course, 
what really replaces the decaying curve given by the Euclidean black hole. Are there similar saddle points that we are missing out that will give, give you some rise or uh, do, they, do they involve some uh, entirely different mechanism? So that is some question that uh, uh, still takes some effort to figure out. So let me now summarize. Uh, so in this talk, we revisited the uh, horowitz pochinsky solution, which is a classical solution in the Euclidean signature. It has a classical entropy, um, but it's an entropy that it has a clear Lorentzian interpretation as counting the states of a string star. Uh, in the type two string theory, it, it can be clearly shown that uh, the horowitz pochinsky solution and the Bell cannot be smoothly connected as classical solutions. Of course, quantum effects might be important. While in the heterodic string theory, we don't really find an obstruction and the linear sig model seems to suggest that a smooth connection is likely. The spectral form factor for highly excited string gas uh, involves other winding modes. And I'm speculating that there can be a family of horowitz pochinsky like solution for these other winding modes as well. And finally, I didn't really talk about this in this talk, but in our paper, uh, we generalized the horowitz pochinsky solution to charge the black holes. Um, basically, the upshot is that for neutral black hole, we have this uh, transition between Horowitz and Horowitz Pochinsky solution and the black hole, while in the charged black hole, it gets mapped to the extremal limit of the charged black hole. Basically, in some cases, we argue that as you decrease the mass of a charged black hole, as it to, uh, goes towards the extremal limit, it turns into a Horowitz Pochinsky like solution. So uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. It can be a naive question, but uh, when you think about this black hole string correspondence, should you think of it like a dynamical process or uh, you have a parameter like string coupling constant and then you change it and then one uh, configuration just goes to the uh, other one? So how, you, how, you, how should I imagine this, this correspondence? Yeah, so you can, I think the most clear way to think of it is the microcanon example. So it's something in thermal equilibrium you change the mass, and for the smaller mass, it's horowitz pochinsky and for a larger mass, it collapses into a black hole. Uh, of course, you could also think of it as a dynamical process, like in the Lorentz signature, a black hole evaporates, and when its mass is of order the string scale, it might turn into this object. Um, that's another way to think about it. I think I was going to ask a rather similar question, actually, but on that last point. Um, do you see this as being a, a, a way of kind of understanding the, the uh, information, saying something new about the information loss question as in its original kind of form? Frame this in terms of the semi classical question he gave, and then obviously it's going to break down at some point. It looks like this is what it could break down into. In fact. Yeah, but I think. Well, the Hawking's information paradox will be already a paradox much earlier than the point where black hole becomes this small, because at the page time, the black hole is still very large, and you already have a paradox there. So it does not seem immediately relevant. But of course, in general, uh, this discussion is trying to understand better what the microstates of the black hole means. So definitely that question, in the end, should be related to the information paradox. And as I said here, I'm also trying to understand better, for example, the motivation of looking at this spectral form factor is trying to understand how do you see the discreteness of the spectrum uh, by looking at just Euclidean solutions, classical solutions. So uh, there's some attempt in this direction. Uh, is there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. About this microstate counting, uh, there are already calculations done by Strominger Wafa like earlier for supersymmetric black holes, black P-brains, they can count the microstates. So is this your work somehow related to doing this computation for usual Schwarzschild black hole uh, type of problem or? Um, not really. I think, first of all, I'm, they, they 
basically they use some duality to, to count it. I, I'm not using those things. Um, and here I'm not trying, really trying to count the state precisely, like finding many, many objects, many, many classical solutions and the number of classical solutions equals to the number of states. That's not well doing. Just trying to see that, um, for example, the horowitz potency solution gives the correct earlier behavior. So what, give, what gives the uh, later behavior? Um, and it's again, some classical solutions. Um, still different from what they did. So I, I think there might be some questions in the, oh, no. Uh, there's questions in the chat. Right. Uh, if there's no more questions. Uh, can more I ask questions? a question? <laughs> yes, please. Since you mentioned this story can be generalized to charge black hole, what about rotating black holes? Right, so um, charge black hole is easier because we didn't already solve the equations for charge black holes we merely use the so-called solution generating technique, uh, which is a technique uh, for which you, if you know the neutral one, you can use that to generate charge points. Uh, my knowledge on the generalization of that in rotating case is uh, much more limited. So I don't know whether you can use that for rotating black holes. Um, but in general, yeah, I expect that the solution will exist at least when the rotation is uh, small. I, I didn't construct it. Basically, that's an interesting question to think about. Uh, okay, let's thanks this. Uh, thank the speaker. Okay, can you stop recording? Hi. Uh, you know, sure. We have a stick here.